It's Monday, June 27th, and you're listening to the Geek News Central Podcast, sponsored by GoDaddy.com. Geek News Central is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. I want to get a great show lined up for you. Yes, I'm glad to be back here in, in Honolulu. It's a beautiful evening, so I got, a, I got a lot to talk about tonight. Strap in. Here it comes. All right, people, I need a go no go for the Geek News Central podcast. Digital archive recorders. Here go, Flight. Microphone. Here go, Flight. Video feed. Go. Web browser. Go. RSS data stream aggregator. Go, Flight. Interflux totism suppressor. All right, I'm confused. Host readiness check. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. The Geek News Central podcast is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to go. Q Todd in five. Bucky, Bucky, who's got the button? Four. There is no cause for alarm. Three. Everybody hold on to something. Two. Just press the button. One. It's showtime. Aloha and welcome to the Geek News Central podcast, coming to you as live as it can be from the beautiful state of Hawaii via the Geek News Central portable. Uh, actually, not portable. <laughs> We're in our regular studio overlooking Honolulu. Everyone, welcome to the show. Again, my name is Todd Cochran. I want to encourage you to get over to geeknewscentral.com and check out all our great content. Of course, check out our archive shows available via the website. When you get over there, you'll see a whole bunch of different opportunities for you to, to catch programming out that we're doing. We've got the, uh, of course, we've got the Geek News Central audio and video podcast, of course, what you are listening or watching to today. We've got our special media events feed, which provides uh, content on special media events. We have the Gadget Professor audio or video feed. So that's produced every Thursday by Don Bain. And we, of course, got Robot Underpants by Langley, which comes out every Monday. So you'll find all the subscription options there in the second column of the website. All you got to do is subscribe via RSS, iTunes, Zoom Marketplace. And uh, that's the best way, really, to get connected with the show and make sure you don't miss a single episode. The second thing you need to do is really get over to the website and sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter really is where I kind of just basically do a new email blast immediately following the show, and it contains everything that I'll have in the actual show notes. So don't worry. If you're not signed up for the newsletter, you come over to the website. You'll find all the uh, all the links to all the content that I've covered today. So something piques your interest that you want to look a little, bit, look a little more deeply into, you can, you can do so. Um, lots going on here. We'll talk about uh, some family stuff here in a few minutes. But uh, if you're watching us on the Roku, Boxy, Samsung, IPTV, we want to welcome you to watch the show that way. And, of course, if you're watching tonight on Ustream or at live.geeknewscentral.com, we want to thank you for uh, jumping on board. Starting the next show, we're going to be streaming from the official Tech Podcast Network stream. We're going to be starting to run a lot of live content on TPN's uh, stream over there. I'll be contributing content uh, three or four times a week along with other content creators over there. So we're going to have a full lineup of content for you via our official Tech Podcast Network stream. I'm going to be dropping the standard Geek New Central stream that I run here when I'm in the studio, and it will be strictly on the TPN feed. It will be kind of transparent for you because you can come to the same pages to find the information. Plus, we'll have a new landing page for you over Tech Podcast where you can look and watch or listen and watch to all the great content that's going to be on that uh, on that channel. Now, here's the best thing. We're going to give you a lineup schedule so that you'll know when to tune in for live content. And then we're going to, through the next month or so, we'll work on a process in order to have some replay going on as well from other people's content. So we'll be working on that and getting that squared away. Um, if you have comments on tonight's show, you can always send an email to, oh, let me put this up so you guys can actually see it, and call the show hotline at 619-342-7365, 619-342-7365, or you can email me at geeknews at gmail.com. Of course, I'm always available at Geek News on Twitter, and uh, you can re reach me there. Just uh, do an at sign and put Geek News in front of it. Easy peasy. Okay, um, before I get into the sponsor message, I do want to give you guys a family update you guys know that I was in uh, the Washington, D.C. area um, last week. I actually uh, drove down and saw my sister on Friday in Chesapeake, Virginia. So we didn't have a meetup Friday night. I had a great uh, time with her. Uh, it was about 7 o'clock in the evening. 
before I was getting ready to roll out, and my wife texts me a basically a nine one one message saying, "Hey, uh, there's a problem. Uh, call me immediately." And I I called her back, and apparently her father had um, went into cardiac arrest. His heart had stopped, and they were able to revive him. Although I don't know, the details are a little sketchy on how long. The heart had stopped. I don't know if he was being monitored at the time. Um, all I do know is they were able to get his heart beating again. He went into ICU. And the details are even right now, even uh, really four days later, pretty sketchy. Um, she uh, was pretty much in a panic, as you can expect. Now, she was originally supposed to leave for Okinawa today. And she was supposed to go out today and then be with the family for, for three weeks. And I was going to be here. But give me time to get home, get things situated, get the pass down on what she had scheduled for the kids and so forth. But she, uh, I told her, hey, just, you know, whatever you got to do, change the airline tickets or book a new flight. Um, so she was able to get on a new flight uh, Saturday morning. Actually, I was still airborne on the way home when she was flying out to Okinawa. So I landed in, uh, in the afternoon and went and picked the kids up at a family friend's house. And... Um, she uh, made it in, and she's basically pretty much, by knowing, knowing her, she hasn't left the uh, the hospital since, but um, he is still alive, but uh, the outlook's not good. I think they have him on a life support at this point. Uh, don't have a lot of details. It hasn't been explained to me. I'm going to do a call after the show tonight to see what I can find out. But uh, that's kind of the status on that. We knew this was kind of forthcoming. There's, this is not a surprise. Um, he's had some serious, very serious health is, issues for the last couple of years. And uh, so it was one of the reasons why she was going home, because we, we kind of knew time was drawing near. But uh, anyway, she got home, and that was the main thing. And um, so I was, I'm glad she was able, able to get there before he passed away. So but we are just keeping our fingers crossed and uh, saying our prayers, and we'll see where where this thing all falls out here over the next week or so. Um, hey, just want to get back right into the content here. Um, GoDaddy, longtime sponsor here at the show. And, of course, I want to make sure that you get a chance to support our sponsor so that we are able to uh, keep the lights on here. And uh, one thing I've got is i got some uh, special deals going on right now uh, through the end of the month. So you only got a few days here left. Our, our deal number one is gone, but deal number two where you get a .co domain for ten ninety nine by using the promo code GEEKJUNE. Is on to the end of the month, so you just got just about four more days here. Dot co domain for ten ninety nine, or you can get a free private domain registration, a nine ninety nine per year value, when you register or transfer one or more domains, and use the com promo code Geek Free to get that private registration with that domain transfer or purchase. So again, Geek June and Geek Free. Of course, we got some other promo codes over here at geeknewcentral.com forward slash GoDaddy. And uh, all a bunch, a whole, just a huge number of codes here for you to use. Uh, Geek 5, save 15% on it, any order $20 or more. Todd 20, save 20% on a one year shared hosting account. So, you know, you guys, uh, when you guys do support the show, it does result in real money. And a uh, check arrived today um, helps keep the uh, lights on and feed the family and pay the bills. So we want to thank GoDaddy for being a sponsor here, and I want you guys to know I definitely appreciate your continued support as GoDaddy is a longtime sponsor here at uh, at Geek News Central. Um, lots going on. Um, you know, trying to kind of get adjusted here. Kids are taking a little bit advantage of me because mom is, you know, normally a little bit more on top of some things than others. Um, one thing I have had to do is put the hammer down on the Xbox usage already. Um, one, I can't, you know, I was messing around getting ready for the show tonight and trying to figure out what was going on with bandwidth on the connection we use for uh, the, the feed that goes up to the Flash Media server at Amazon. And I wasn't getting the thorough put that I normally would see, and I couldn't figure it out. And I said, I heard my son in our bedroom talking like, oh, he's uh, Xbox Live Gaming. Does anyone know how much the Xbox Live Gaming, how much bandwidth you use on that? I have no clue what the what the level is. It has to be pretty high, I would assume. So any of you that have heard any statistics on that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Drop me a line here at geeknews at gmail.com. Hey, one thing that we're doing, oh boy, did this thing go dead? Let me, uh, I'm going to have to turn the, uh, 
Yeah, let me show you guys something. We're going to do the first um first uh first episode of the Chrome show on this coming Saturday. It's going to follow the Saturday morning tech show. And you can see here I've got the uh if those of you are watching the video, I've got the uh, Chrome OS screen up there, so we've got this fully integrated into the uh, TriCaster. So I'm really be able to switch back and forth between live and the Chrome screen, which is kind of cool. So I'll be able to show you guys that. So that's on top of, of course, being able to bring in our regular screen picture here. So the, you know that's a little bit of a different view. So we've got this thing dialed in. I'm pretty, uh, pretty stoked about being able to do the first Chrome show. I'm working on the format. It's been a little tougher than I thought because I've just always had such a general show. Uh, having something so focused, I think we're going to be pretty short, 10, 15 minutes on these Chrome Show um, podcasts. So keep them uh, short and snappy, and that way you can just get a few tidbits every week, and uh, that way I can kind of work into it as well. So it's hard for me to do anything in 15 minutes, so we'll see what happens. Of course, we'll be having a Saturday morning tech show, of course. Don't forget about that. Don't forget to get subscribed to the Gadget Professor and Robot Underpants going to go ahead and get into the tech content here in a second but let's take care of just a little bit of business you know one thing that i was assured of when i was traveling was that my family was safe and secure when they were at home uh, whether it be during the daytime or at night when they were sleeping i always knew that our security system was keeping a watchful eye on the property and that if anything was to be amiss that the security system would activate and immediately um, be monitored by the security service that it's tied to that in with that being said you know it really does leave you at a higher level of comfort now never nothing is completely perfect but i will say that it makes me feel a lot better by leaving the home and being able to go on travel and have things secure and uh, under the watchful eye of not only the cameras that surround the property but also the actual security system active in and out that uh, that does the protection. And so I want you to have that same level of security as well. You know, help protect your home with a security system monitored by ADT. ADT is the leader in home security. All I want you to do is call Protect Your Home, who is an authorized ADT dealer. You can call them right now and get $850 of equipment for free in your activation for free. So you can call 1-866-778-3127. That's 1-866-778-3127. And for a $99 installation charge, okay, there is going to be a $99 installation charge and a 36 month, 30, with a 36-month monitoring contract, again, you're going to get that $850 worth of equipment and activation for free. Again, ADT is the number one monitoring service in the country. Of course, it comes with those famous ADT signs, so ADT security signs. And monitoring charges are really, you know, just about a buck a day. And that's going to be cheaper than anything that you're going you're gonna to find and giving you great insurance to, uh, to protect your home. And plus, you'll save 20% on your home insurance policy as well. So uh, definitely check ADT out. You'll find the link at the Geek News Central website. Or again, just give them a call directly at 866-778-3127 now and talk to the representatives there at Protect Your Home, an authorized dealer for ADT. All right, let's go ahead here and get into the content tonight. And um, went a little bit longer on the last show, and uh, tonight I was definitely trying to keep uh, within my constraints that I had put against myself. But uh, we'll see how we do. i got a couple things here to really... Hound on. I guess I got a couple of things that we'll talk a little bit about uh, <laughs> some things going on in the space. But over on torrentfreak.com, and actually, this is kind of an interesting article that, and, and they did a real good job on this, but brings up some good points. Is that there was a, a bill put forth in 1865 that was called the Red Flag Act. And what the Red Flag Act really did was at the time, there was this new thing called the basically the motor coach and it was some of the motor coaches were being driven by steam and the motor coach being the automobile um, was required to have um, some additional people operating the equipment. Now what they did 
was the famous Locomotive Act of 1865 in the United Kingdom, which was better known as the Red Flag Act. It was a law that limited the speed of the new so-called automobile to two miles per hour in urban areas and required them to always have a crew of three, a driver, a stoker. Now, the stoker was the guy that run the steam engine and a man or actually fired the steam engine and a man who had walked before the automobile waving a red flag. Now, what this reason that this was enacted was that the locomotive industry was worried about the automobile in its current form uh, impacting their business. And it kind of sounds kind of familiar with the a lot of things going on in today's space. You find bigger companies who have established business plans trying to put enforcement actions against a variety of different companies in order to protect their business interests, for a better word. And as they promoted this with the Congress and with the legislatures and Parliament, um, their industries were claimed that they were a special interest and that they had a public interest to protect the locomotive industry, per se. So essentially what happened was, was a stagecoach, which was, of course, a stagecoach driven by horses, and also the locomotive industry, the railroad industry, was very much in, uh, you know, trying to protect their, their status quo. Um, and at the time, the, uh, the legislative of the, the parliament in the UK agreed, and uh, they, uh, they, they put in laws to protect those businesses. Um, and we see a lot of this going on today, and we see it's just, it's, it's just it goes to show you that lessons learned of the past have, have not been carried forward and we're, we're bound to make these same mistakes again and again and again. And we see some actions today that we're going to talk about in the show a little later about the about Hollywood making pressures against uh, one of the largest ISPs in the UK to block some BitTorrent sites. We're going to talk about some other actions that are going on as well where um, basically industry is saying, help us, help us, protect us, protect us, protect us from the from the big bad internet. So we're going to, we're going to go into that a little later, but um, just kind of a prelude to things to come a little bit later here in the show and how we're going to tie it back to this red flag act of 1865. Now we all know that the mobile networks have been, you know, have trying to come up with bragging rights on who's the fastest. Now on this past trip, when I traveled, I only was able to get a 4G Verizon connection in one location. And that was at the airport right next to, uh, to Dulles, right next to the main airport. I was able to get a good 4G connection, saw some pretty astounding download speeds. I was pretty surprised by the actual, I guess, you know, vivaciousness of the actual connection. Um, the rest of the time I was completely on Sprint 3G, and believe me, I've got a Sprint 3G, 4G card, and I got a Verizon 3G, 4G card, or LTE. And um, really, that was the only time I was up on 4G. And while I was pretty happy, you know, and having traveled throughout the United States here, in the, you know, a lot in the past weeks, going into Denver, going to L.A., going through San Francisco, um, all these places, I activated the, you know, the EVDO card or the MiFi to see what kind of connection we'd have. And, and D.C. was the only place close to Dallas Airport where I had 4G. So I was in major metropolitan areas, and yet <clears throat> 3G was continuing to be the speed. Now, I've always said that, I've, from my experience, the Sprint 3G has always been faster than Verizon 3G, and but yet Verizon is claiming that they're the leader of the pack and dominating uh, mobile networks right now. And I, I want to say not so fast, Verizon. You need to uh, to get your 4G network rolled out into a lot more places before you can do that because, quite honestly, everyone else is kicking your butt when it comes to uh, the 3G speed in the areas where there's no 4G availability. And even when there is 4G availability, when I'm like on a clear connection um, or I'm on a Verizon, a Sprint 4G, those are pretty impressive speeds as well. So um, I think overall, Verizon's going to have a lot of competition as time goes on. But Speed tests done right now show that they're handily handing, handling everyone else in areas where they do have LTE rolled out. 
we talked a little bit uh, several months ago about uh, TSA and the scanning of passengers as you're walking through. And you guys know that I all refuse to be scanned. I now request a, a pat down. Matter of fact, this time when I requested the pat down at uh, Honolulu International, I was uh, for the first time escorted to a, um, a secondary room, a private room. And uh, the, I think it's because they begin to know me a little bit. And I think they were just basically probably maybe looking to push my button a little while, a little bit, but they, they asked good morning, escorted me into a private room and did a little more thorough inspection <laughs> uh, for whatever reason. I don't know, but it uh, re involved me uh, removing a portion of my clothing. <laughs> so uh, I was quite happy to oblige. Um, believe me, uh, they, there's nothing to, nothing exciting to see about me being half naked. But um, TSA is now fined at Logan International. They believe they have identified a cancer cluster in their ranks. According to documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act and released by the Electronic Privacy Information Center, um, apparently TSA agents there requested the uh, dosimetra counter, you know, the dosimeters, and they were refused. And uh, But it appears that uh, a number of TSA, there basically have been some diagnosis of cancer and around some TSA agents at um, Logan International. So once again, I think what's happening is, is they were so fast to rush some of these scanners to market, I don't think they have a real good handle on, on what's going on there. Now, I think for most of us, just walking through these scanners and getting scanned once in a, you know, however often you fly, is probably not an issue, but I'm up to 37 flight segments this year already. I'm already up to about 80,000 frequent flyer miles. I'm already getting extra radiation flying. I'm also going through x-ray machines, uh, you know, three, four times a month. I don't want to have that extra, whatever minimal radiation risk they say there is. But standing besides those machines, those TSA folks are obviously here, um, but and very potentially being um, radiated in, in a in a much higher level than what everyone said they had been. Now, what uh, always makes me laugh is one of the first times I asked for the um, for the hand pat down was the guy told me there's no radiation hazard here. He says this is just uh, radio frequencies, and that really made me laugh too because obviously he didn't know radio frequencies is what really makes up radiation, uh, depending on what power and so forth frequency. But um, <laughs> long story short here, there is uh, a possible cancer cluster found among some TSA workers. So pretty scary stuff on that standpoint. Ask for the pat down and, uh, and other people will follow. That's for sure. TSA also, and we've heard about this in the news, decided they wanted to make a 95-year-old woman uh, who was having, was basically wearing uh, a, a, an adult uh, diaper of sorts, uh, made her remove that during one of the pat-down inspections. 95-year-old woman, and they made her, this is just how humiliating, this was my grandmother, 95 years old, and they forced me to take her into a private room and remove her undergarment unfathomable unfathomable to me i just cannot comprehend um the tsa said that they were following guidelines amazing amazing I just don't get it i really don't now switching subjects here away from the tsa let's talk a little bit about right haven uh, right Haven has got a new lawsuit against them. They've been charged with racketeering. <laughs> and uh, some law firm has filed a 30-page uh, lawsuit against them, charging that uh, the extortion tactics and fraudulent conduct detailed in the complaint constitute a, pr a predicate act under RICO. Another one, extortion, because each communication were threats intended to obtain money on property permissed upon legal action that was complete sham. And two, fraud, because each mailing phone call and email uh, furthered 
and executed the scheme of, to defraud Wright Haven's targets. So a uh, 30-page indictment against them, or not an indictment, but a lawsuit about again, from a specific individual. We'll see how far this one goes, but it's nice to see the shoe is on the other foot here with them. A little more scary thing on the privacy side, Arizona police and some of those documents that were apparently released by the hacker group, um, the Arizona police have been told their, their troopers to search rest, arrestees' iPhones for anti-police apps. Now, I didn't know there was such a thing as anti-police apps, but this is pretty amazing. They were told to search the iPhones for applications such as OpenWatch, which is a simple app for recording people without it, without it displaying on the iPhone. The police were also told to look for speed trap identifying apps and also an app that lets people spoof caller ID numbers. So what they were going to do if they found those apps, I don't know. But we do know that uh, police are authorized underneath uh, um, some recent rulings to ask for your phone during a, just a, a general traffic stop and can review what's on your iPhone. That's been upheld by the Justice Department and some uh, judicial rulings. So don't be surprised if you're in Arizona and you uh, you are stopped by the police for them to ask your ask for your phone, and they start looking for these uh, these apps. So uh, Open Watch, the uh, caller ID spoofing app, and also the one that uh, um, allows you to uh, record people. So anyway. Pretty crazy stuff. And, of course, you know, I don't condone the information that was released on those correctional facility officers and those police officers. But at the same time, it's pretty uh, pretty eye-opening that uh, through these memos that released, the Arizona officials have had told their police officers to do what they're doing. Let's move on here. Let's talk a little bit about the PC and where we're at today. There's an article over on barons.com that talks about really where we're at in the PC world. And specifically, there is this indication through declining uh, uh, chip sales and so forth that many of us are not using our PCs as much as we once did. So the question that's being asked by Barron's, has the personal computer business become too toxic to touch? And what they're stating here is companies like Micron Technology which makes DRAM memory chips that go into PCs, among other things, last Thursday reported uh, disappointing financial results for the third quarter and warned that its view into the PC market is not encouraging. So I think, you know, I kind of understand what they're talking about, where once before where I completely relied on my laptop or my desktop, you know, I'm finding myself now going to my iPad, I'm going to my iPhone, especially when I'm on travel, how much have you have you how much have you guys been able to cut back on your actual utilization of your main PC, whether it be a Mac or be a, a Windows machine? How much have you actually been able to cut back because of your tablet and your different types of devices? Do you guys find yourself cutting that usage? I think it probably a lot of it, of course, has to do whether or not you've made that move and, and jumped onto a, a tablet or have a, a mobile device as a smartphone. But how many of these you have? Have you guys seen a shift? Have you have you shifted away? I know that my wife has, and I don't foresee ever having to buy her another laptop. She'll be able to use you know one that we'll have here as an, you know hers one specifically. Whereas my kids, though, on the other hand, I think they're using the PC more than they are other devices. So what do you guys think? Love to hear your feedback. Call the show hotline at six one nine three four two seven three six five or email me at geeknews at gmail.com with your comments on whether you think the personal computer business is basically on the decline and whether or not, uh, or what it will take to get you back or vice versa. Or do you think you'll never come back? Love to hear your feedback on that as well. Now, kind of feeding into this, there's a good story here on how, um, what's going on with the Wi-Fi utilization. Uh, the folks at, um, let me look here. What was the name of the company? Murakai, M-E-R-K-A-I, has published data based on device usage from 
its customer networks. And I, I don't know exactly what Mirakai does, but apparently it provides businesses with Wi-Fi service. And what they found out here is that the average monthly Wi-Fi data consumption for Android, iPhone, and iPod averaged about 40 megs as compared to the iPad average of about 200 megs per month. Now, if you look at 200, uh, 2010, I'll actually bring this up on the screen so you guys can see this. Um, if you, if you, and this is over at uh, Technologizer, Techno, I never pronounced this site right, Technologizer.com. <laughs> and the chart here on the right, um, 2010 versus 2010, shows that uh, the Mac is, in 2010, was using 21% of, of Wi-Fi, 13% in 11. PC was 25 versus 16 in 11. Uh, Windows XP, 18 versus 7%. Um, you go down and look at the Apple iPod. It's using about 7% up now to 11%. If you look at the Apple iPhone, 25% last year, 32% this year. Uh, where does the iPad fall in on this? Oh, and now the iPad is finally just basically broaching its 4%, where last year wasn't even on the on the horizon here. So... That's pretty amazing. And when you think about in 2010, at least 64% of Wi-Fi users were using traditional computers, Windows, PC, and Macs. In 2011, that's down 36%. Pretty crazy. Where 58% of Wi-Fi users are on mobile devices, iPhone, iPod, touches, iPads, and Android devices. So a uh, pretty big shift here. And I think it feeds off this past article talking about Barron's, where our general PC usage is way, way down. So again, love to hear your feedback on this and uh, and uh, tell me how you guys have changed your computing habits if you have or have not. Is the word geek becoming too liberally used? You guys know that uh, when the Geek New Central, uh, geeknewcentral.com was launched, you know, geek was uh, still a, uh, you know, a kind of a unique commodity and uh, not very many people were super geeky, but I think everyone now thinks they're super geeky. So are fake geeks or wannabe geeks dooming those of us that consider ourselves true geeks? Um, I do consider myself a true geek and, you know, uh, dig into stuff pretty deep. I know, and here's something that's kind of funny, too. I run into content creators who are, quote, unquote, do tech shows. And not necessarily so much on tech podcasts, but other... Well, it's in other sites. And when I talk to them one-on-one -on -one about technical issues, maybe they're having with an RSS feed or with their website or with a server issue, I kind of get this like deer in the headlights look to kind of glaze over. Um, a lot of people claim to be super technical, but in the, I guess, real world, they're not so technical. And, um, I don't know, you know, maybe some people could say the same thing about me. I, I guess I consider myself a geek because I've, you know, I've had a huge, uh, background in working in, in electronics and I do a lot of technical stuff. I, you know, I really consider myself a true geek in the all sense of the word. So do you think those that are fake geeks are dooming those of us that consider us to be real geeks? Um, I don't know. And that's an article that Slashdot is asking. They're asking, are fake geeks dooming the real ones? And this what, what really prompted this was the, um, I guess, the new Miss America uh, claims she is a, a geek, per se, which I thought was kind of interesting. And um, so, I don't know. Is, was, do you, does she qualify as a real geek? I haven't heard her talk or talk about technical stuff at all. And not to say that I'm a that I do a complete 100% uh, good job all the time. But um, we'll see. What do you guys think? Love to hear your feedback. Hey, um, Firefox, you guys know that Firefox rolled a new rev, and they're going to be rolling revs, bang, bang, bang. They're just going to be popping them out real quick. But apparently the enterprise people are really upset. Uh, we know that three months ago, Mozilla released the long-awaited Firefox 4. And, of course, last week they shipped Firefox 5. And next month they're going to ship, or actually six weeks, about five weeks from now, they're going to they're going to ship Firefox six. So many IT managers 
are going insane because going from Firefox 3 to Firefox 4 was quite a length of time. A lot of them to do re uh, uh, regression testing. But with only six weeks or five weeks in between release cycles now, many enterprise people are saying, hey, I can't keep up. We can't test. This is costing us a lot of money. We're not able to make sure that one version to the next doesn't work and our users are demanding that we keep up. And they're not able to. And they told Firefox, you need to change this strategy. Tell Chrome, you guys need to change this strategy. You can't be updating all the time like this. This just, this kills us. And basically, Firefox was pretty straightforward and said, sorry, uh, we're not going to slow down. We want to bring new features to our user base at a quick, quick, you know, a quick pace. And if you want to have a browser that, you know, lasts a long time and doesn't get updated very often, maybe you should go over and use Internet Explorer. They didn't tell them directly to do that, but that's basically what they said without setting it, saying it. And uh, so some of the corporate users are very unhappy. And um, they shouldn't have been surprised because Firefox was saying that they were going to do this. But um, some commentators basically have said that Mozilla is alienating its enterprise customers. Well, oh well. Maybe it's time for IT departments to establish uh, some new policies and, and move a little quicker. You know, after all, I'm sure some of you that are working for corporate America are still stuck on Internet Explorer version 6. You know, that's pretty sad. Um, here's a good one. How many, you know, here I've got, oh, by the way, don't know if I told you guys on the last show or not, but I upgraded to the iPhone 4. And of course, the day I got it, it was announced that maybe the iPhone 5 was coming. And I will say this about the iPhone 4. Um, when I'm driving, the places that uh, my iPhone 3GS used to drop connection with, this one drops in the same exact spot. So it doesn't have any more, doesn't have any better ability to, to change cell towers than any other device I've had. And at the same time, it's dropping in just a few more places. I've got a Mophie case around it. So I'm not touching the side of it anyway or causing the the signal to be affected by my hand. But um, I think it's worse from a connection standpoint. If you're sitting still and you don't have any changes going on with the cell tower, it's fine. But uh, other than that, boy, it's it's a little bit aggravating. Good old AT&T. But here I've got a data plan with this. I've got a data plan with my iPad. I have a data plan with my MiFi. <laughs> so, you know, I'm paying multiple times here. So the question is, is Europe leading the way? Or, or the thing is, we shouldn't be surprised that Europe is leading the way with a new data plan. Whereas France Telecom's Orange has been allowing its iPad owners to share one allotment of data with a phone while the other shade data plans... So in other words, you can use your iPhone and your iPad on the same plan. Basically, what you would do is you have, you just pick your amount of data amount that you want to be able to move, and it's shared between the two devices. Um, let's see if I can see the price point here, if that will blow up. So here's a, and I guess this is in, I don't know if this is actually in pounds or if this is in euros. Oh my goodness, it's like a little funny shaped L. I have no idea what that symbol is. But, for example, if you want the iPhone 4 and iPad 2 to be on 16 gigs, 16 gigs a month of traffic, 99, whatever it is, if you want to go all the way up to 32 gigs for do both devices, 299. But the prices intersect. They're the same exact price, and you get it shared between the, uh, the two devices, which is pretty cool. We've talked about, you know, they've talked about shared data plans here. Well, I guess it's Aust in Austria. I don't know what kind of uh, uh, mo money they use in Austria. But um, they've talked about doing that here in the United States. And um, so I'm just wondering, I, I can't wait. I hope they do this because I'm not using all my bandwidth on the... Uh, 
on the iPad, and I'm definitely not using all the bandwidth on my on my iPhone. And I could very easily get away with you know having one data plan for both. And for those of you that are watching, there is the uh, basically the price breakdown. But uh, cool stuff, and um, they can even get 600 minutes. Unlimited text, unlimited BT open zone, Wi-Fi access, and a two gig shared data allowance for sixty five, whatever this currency dom 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 denomination is. So, uh, but anyway, it breaks out the full pricing there for uh, for both devices. But um, pretty cool stuff. So we'll see if this type of data plan is brought here to the U.S. At some point, they got to right. Otherwise, they're just completely killing us. Hey, at what point, um, well, actually, let me ask this a different way. Could you go seven days without using a, a mouse? There's a good article over on IT World talking about a gentleman that went seven days without using a mouse, or at least he tried to go seven days without using a mouse. Um, it's almost impossible to go mouseless, and largely because many websites are not really set up to allow you to be uh, to use just a, your keyboard. So anyway, I have this link up in the show notes for you to check out. It's a pretty good article. It talks about the things that they found out. i got a bunch of articles that not opened up here. I wonder why that happened. Um, over on extremetech.com, this is a, they've got a new look to their website. Uh, they must have made a, a change to their layout. I think we've heard about a lot of the new um, releases coming to iOS 5, but Beta 2 was released over the weekend, and developers are picking up... Uh, some, you know, basically some insights into what wasn't available on the previous version of the previous beta that is now. And of course, some of the stuff has already been announced, but one of the big ones is wireless syncing with iTunes has been enabled and is ready for testing. And Apple's also tweaked the uh, new, new, new notification system in the beta release. The new notification screen now has an icon next to the notification text with that corresponds with the app that generated the alert. That's cool. This way you can tell at a glance which notification are SMS messages, calendars, appointments, or third-party apps. And uh, so that the, the, app, the developers are pretty happy with that. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting here, too, is some feel that the over-air syncing and over-air updating is a way for Apple to essentially shut down um, or get people back on track instead of having them be jailbroke all the time. So... My understanding is now you can go into Apple, though, and they will actually jailbreak your phone for you if you ask. Um, I don't know about this. Does, has anyone done this? I've heard that, you, of course, you can buy an unlocked phone now. But the second question is, how many of you have actually got one? And did anyone actually go into Apple and have it done? Because I hear that they will do it at the Genius Bar. So... I don't know if they'll do a 3GS, but I'm having a hard time unlocking a 3GS. And I don't know if they'll unlock at the point where you can change out the SIM or not. But um, but uh, this is kind of interesting here. Um, I need to dig into that information a little more. I just don't have enough to give you guys a good answer on this. Name Any of you that experienced it already, love to hear your, your input on that. Bloomberg uh, at big, excuse me, businessweek.com, uh, an article at uh, part of Bloomberg talked about uh, human errors feeling hacking. And uh, this is pretty shocking. And it, this is, should be um, basically homework for all of us and make us to think a little bit. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security ran a test this year to see how hard it was for hackers to corrupt workers and gain access to computer systems. Well, it turned out it wasn't very hard. The staff secretly dropped computer disk and USB thumb drives in the parking lots of government buildings and private contractors. Of those who picked them up, 60% of the people plugged the devices into office computers to be curious to see what they contained. If the driver CD case had an official logo, 90% of them that were picked up were installed. That's some crazy stuff. Number one rule, you find media anywhere laying around, you find a USB drive, no matter how sexy that thing looks, don't plug it into your machine. Um, hundreds of incidents, you know, obviously going 
unreported when it comes to security breaches on uh, on on machines, and people are becoming much smaller in organizing attacks. Uh, you know, you don't have to be a big company to be hacked. You know, people can send you. Um, you know, I get emails all the time that are to find out who they're from that contain a spreadsheet or a PDF file or a doc. I don't open them. I just they go into immediately into the the delete folder. Um, just because I don't trust them. If I don't know you, I'm not going to open a document from you. You know, what they found out was that a spreadsheet that contained an embedded Adobe uh, system incorporated flash file that exploited a bug then unknown to Adobe was the way that the hackers were able to get in and uh, basically um, hack the RSA's secure ID system, which is going to cost millions of dollars for banks to to basically reissue security ID tokens and so forth. Um, but they've got a whole set of terminology now for different types of attack. Whale phishing, um, spear phishing, uh, all kinds of different uh, flipping burgers, you know, all kinds of weird, uh, basically weird uh, uh, hack it's different types of hacking and then some of the stuff I'm you know I don't know what type of methods they're using but most of it's social engineering so be careful out there okay and I'll have this link up in the show notes for you guys to read and share with uh, with friends apparently the 50 and over cloud is flocking to social networks Facebook use among the over 50 user crowd has risen faster than any other group according to uh, Nielsen overall membership in the social network grew 41% between 2009 2011 among older users the figure was 84%. So for those of, for those of you that are over 50, you're rushing to social networks like Facebook at a faster pace even to Twitter than what uh, younger people are, which is uh, pretty amazing as well. You guys know that the they did some white space testing here in the United States uh, last year. Uh, Microsoft is now going into the UK doing some uh, TV spectrum white space testing um, in the United Kingdom. So what they're, Microsoft's doing is they're working with a large group of companies in the UK and launching a new trial of wireless internet transmission. And basically what they've done here is on the digital space, they have there's a little bit of an area in between uh, frequency bands. And basically Microsoft is coming in and they're doing testing in between those bands to see if they can get effective use of those for what they're kind of terming super Wi-Fi. And uh, it's pretty exciting. I hope that this uh, advances because it's basically some of those frequencies are really prime real estate and have good penetration and good range. So I'm hoping at some point that uh, uh, mobile companies and so forth will be able to use some of that white space to, uh, to their advantage. One thing that happened to me tonight when I was getting ready for the show is that Chrome, I, I, every once in a while I see, you know, Chrome, you know, I think on their fast release schedule has had some some issues because every once in a while Chrome flash dies. And when flash dies, I got to bring the whole uh, whole system down. I got to bring Chrome all the way down and then restart it. And, of course, all my tabs re have to recover. But tonight I'm seeing a bunch of pages that uh, didn't reload through the recover, so I'm having to keep clicking on those as I'm moving through the tabs. But it's, it's one of those things that Chrome has got some some issues right now when, when it comes to Flash. But uh, moving on here, Answer.com has uh, essentially been gutted. They've laid off about 65 of their 90 employees in Israel. Um, they cleared out another 25 or so, I believe, in the United States. They relieved the CEO and CTO. So apparently there's a lot of action going on with uh, with Answers.com. The new owners have essentially uh clean house who they're going to bring on to run it i don't know but they're saying that they're still focused on their users and um but they're not going into too many details of what's going on here but uh obviously they they got rid of a whole bunch of people the ftc excuse me the fcc came out with a report today that um it's this great report with lots of data talking about the different mobile carriers, talking about AT&T, talking about Verizon, Sprint, Clearwire, uh, Metro PCS, US Cellular, a whole bunch of different, you know, four or five other different companies. And it talked about the state of the uh, uh, networks, who's transmitting on which uh, frequencies, how much each company owns of each spectrum, 
and so forth. Talks about the di- number of pops and different uh, cell towers that are available. And they didn't basically they put the information together, but they didn't uh, come to any conclusions. So the the competition report says nothing, but provides a lot of data. So here's the question: Is is did the FCC kind of quietly say, you know, why didn't they say something? That they, you know, and if, especially with the T-Mobile and AT and T deal going forward. Was the FCC scared to make a commentary that would probably affect the $39 billion merger deal? Um, some see this report as a victory um, for those that are fighting the, uh, you know, the fighting the, the merger. But some others are saying the report says, hey, doesn't say anything and that there's not competition. So no one really knows how to read the conclusions that the FCC came to now they did provide a lot of data they talked about spectrum holdings like i said they talked about uh you know who owns what and where and uh but again they didn't really say that there was if there was a competition issue or not uh makes you wonder so i have the link up the show notes you guys can check it out good analysis by the folks over at gigaohm.com and i have the link of course up to this uh in the show notes how many of you have uh, been to, and I haven't been to the Getty Museum, um, I, but uh, from everything I've read, it's a great art museum to go to. But apparently Google has used Goggles, uh, the Goggle app, to bring the Getty Museum to life. So Google Goggles is getting all museums, uh, basically gives all of us access to these museums. And you can get a virtual guided tour through this on your on your on your app. So um, pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff, not scuff, <laughs> that Google has done with uh, with Google's or goggles or however you pronounce uh, G O G G L E S. The goggles app. How many of you are using the goggles app? How many of you have played around with it? I have a little bit. It's kind of a cool, it's a pretty cool app. It really really is. All right, this next article is over on te- technology, technologyreview.com. And this is a, a little bit of an odd one. The report that the human gen- uh, genome has been contaminated with mycoplasma DNA. Okay, so I just destroyed that. Discover of alien DNA in the published human genome raises important questions about preventing virtual infections. Now, they, they didn't make this real clear, but apparently early this year, molecular biologists announced that 20% of non-human genome databases are contaminated with human DNA. In other words, if you've got a, an animal, they're finding contamination within the actual samples that contain uh, bacteria or, or hair, you know, different types of things. Not necessarily hair, I shouldn't say that, but, you know, little things have made it into the samples that have caused it to be contaminated. But they're saying now the human genome itself has become contaminated. And they said they found sequences from mycoplasma in the human genome database. So if the database, if it's just the database that is affected, then was that a software virus that put that in there? Or was that an actual microbiology type of virus that made it into I don't fully understand this. Someone that is a science major that works in this field, please read this and come back to us and give us some some details here because apparently they use some sort of chips that have, I guess that they have information on these chips, DNA data on them, and they don't explain exactly if these are like memory sticks or whatever, but they're shared between different biology labs. And um, kind of it's really kind of they're not real clear. They don't make this an easy read for the lay person. But uh, this is an article published by MIT. So what would you expect? Uh, these guys get in deep. Um, they're saying what to do. The level of contamination, the way in which it is spreading, suggests that researchers are losing the battle to eliminate it. We fear current tools will be inadequate to catch genes which have jumped the silicon barrier, they say. What the heck does that mean? Catch genes that have jumped the silicon barrier. 
I don't get it. I really don't. It intrigued me because it sounded like their master samples were contaminated, but the more I read into the article, it sounded like it wasn't the actual physical samples. It was actually the database data that had been contaminated. I don't know how the heck that can be possible, but uh, this is what they're saying. I have a link up in the show notes. You guys can check it out yourself. If you're as confused as I am, uh, don't be surprised. Oh, what was, what's this? Oh, that's nice. They started an ad for me. <laughs> if those of you on the East Coast, uh, be aware that there's going to be a satellite launch out of the Virginia spaceport late Tuesday night. I guess they're going to launch a U.S. Air Force Minotaur 1 rocket, putting up a, a military satellite of some sort. So if you're on the East Coast, be aware of that. We had a pretty close flyby today of an asteroid 7,500 miles from the uh, basically uh, becoming a potential uh, impact uh, asteroid, but it uh, it, it skimmed uh, across the across the uh, across space. It got a pretty good view of it uh, through a variety of different uh, uh, observatories. So and they said, "Hey, we got some pictures of this thing," and I went, "Oh, that'll be cool." And it's really not much of a picture at all, but uh, link will be up in the show notes if you're interested. Hey, Yahoo Connected TV is not dead yet. Apparently, uh, Yahoo is looking to play, take Yahoo TV into more devices. This is kind of surprising. Uh, we hadn't seen too much movement on the Yahoo TV front, but uh, apparently Yahoo is going to be launching in some hardware from Samsung, LG, and Sony this year. So we'll have keep you advised of that. Pretty cool stuff. Slingbox is headed to, sing, excuse me, a Slingbox client is headed to Boxy, and uh, that excites me. So if you got a Slingbox and you've, uh, uh, you're you going to be able to load Boxy on your actual computer and be able to use the client from there. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Be able to watch your, uh, your Slingbox from home. A lot of stuff going on in the, uh, on the law front. We talked a little bit earlier at the beginning of the show where we essentially talked about that Red Flag Act. But here we've got a case where the MPAA is continuing to go after the file, the folks from Hotfile, hotfile.com. And uh, these guys are putting up an epic battle. But essentially the MPAA in their court battle against uh, Hotfile has requested everything under the sun source code. They've required every username. They've required financial data. They required every version of the code that's ever been run on the site. Um, they've requested information about every file and how it's tied to which user and so forth. So the folks from Hotfile are complying with some of this stuff on this lawsuit, but boy, oh boy, um, they are digging in pretty deep. So if you've ever done, put anything on Hotfile that wasn't supposed to be there, uh, the MPAA may be getting their way. Hollywood is forcing an ISP in the UK to use child abuse filter against file sharing site. Of course, last year, Hollywood's Motion Picture Association went to court seeking an injunction against the UK ISP BT, British Telecom, in order to force them to block Newsbin 2, which is a uh, Usenet site. And uh, basically, they were able to take them offline, but uh, this site has been resurrected. And essentially, what's going on now is that uh, what they're doing now is the MPAA is going to BT, and they say, okay, you've got this software in place for to block uh, child porn sites. We want you now to start blocking your users from being, at, being able to access Newsbin. Uh, we want you to shut this down, and they're basically uh, strong-arming BT to, uh, to block this website. Now, this is kind of an interesting development here because BT developed this uh, um, this application called CleanFeed. Again, it's a content blocking system that's been in operation since 2004. They spent more than 500 pounds, 500,000 pounds on the, uh, uh, on the development of the application. And it was specifically built to, again, block child pornography sites. And now they want, uh, because they have this in place, MPAA is saying, hey, you've got the ability, block them, and without the court order or anything. So it is interesting to see here what's going on with this. And um, it appears the MPAA is prepared to take B uh, US IP ISP BT to court if they don't uh, comply with this request. 
So they're asking nicely, and then they're saying, if you don't do this, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and try to get an injunction to make you do it. German researchers have found that just five cars in a thousand communicating with one another is all it takes to reduce congestion. And basically what they're saying is, is if they had certain cars being able to report back to a central station that was basically monitoring vehicle traffic and movement, five cars in a thousand would be able to give uh, traffic light operators and municipalities enough information to alleviate traffic congestion by rerouting vehicles, uh, making uh, suggestions on traffic flow and so forth. So if they're able to do that with just five vehicles, um, what imagine if all our vehicles could basically be communicating with, with a central station and it, it, you know, how many times you've been sitting in a traffic and for no reason the traffic stopped? You know, wouldn't it be better if, if your car had the ability to say, okay, you know, everyone else in this line has been told we're going to roll here in five seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and everyone start to move, <laughs> you know, there's got to be a better way or better yet the car do it itself. And, uh, they, the, the, uh, folks in Germany have found that traffic congestion costs the German economy, $425 million a day and lost time and fuel. Well, I'd love to know how much we're losing here in, in Hawaii. I know we lose a lot. I sit in traffic a lot. All right. Your gadget of the day. And I'm going to be running out of time here soon. Um, over on Ogizmo. It's pretty cool. It's called Scribbly, and you basically can use this on top of your on top of your uh, iPad, and it uh, basically allows you to have a a whiteboard of sorts for different stuff that's up, and you're able to draw on it, pick colors, make notes. It really doesn't write on your screen, but what it really does is gives you that functionality that all of us have on that boards, but you got it right there on your iPad. This is so cool. It's 16 pounds. This is the best, or $16. Um, it's not available right now, but it's going to be available. And as soon as this becomes available, I can see so many uses for different meetings and so forth to, to draw on stuff. Um, I just can't, uh, I can't wait for this to be av available. But again, it's going to be called Scribbly, S-C-R-I-B-B-L-Y. And they don't have a website yet for it. I don't think, yeah, scribbly.co.uk is uh is where the site's at all right moving on here uh 10 gmail gadgets for you to try i have that link up in the show notes for you to check out those of you that are on sage tv um you know that sage tv was charging for updates but because of the recent purchase you can now upgrade your older version version four to five or six for free you don't have to pay for that grade those of you that have paid for an upgrade in the past sorry you're you're not going to get a refund but for those of you that need to upgrade you can um, the folks at Yahoo Connected TV, we talked about them expanding into uh, additional devices, but they're also now being able to watch with you, and they're delivering a more personalized uh, experience. One of the examples they give is if you're watching a Hawaii Five O, and it basically gives you the ability to look at different sites or different places that they're filming in Hawaii. It allows you to vote on your characters and basically has this cool interactive thing. I'm sure we're going to see this come to Google TV as well, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens with this as these new features for Yahoo Connected TV rolls out. Uh, article over on uh, Engadget talking about TomTom's iPhone app has, has been updated. This thing is smoking. Um, it brings HD traffic updates along for the ride. And let me just bring this, a, a picture of this up so you guys can see this. Um, I'm sure what's going on here is that there's a little bit of cross-collaboration going on and TomTom's pulling from a variety of sources. But it actually shows you where traffic congestion is. And, and basically, you can choose to route around it if you can. They color code you know, the delays, the color code, uh, where it's open. So this is pretty cool stuff here. And I don't know how this fully works, but it's a $20, uh, app purchase. And, uh, but again, pretty cool stuff here from the Tom, Tom iPhone app available now via the, uh, via the app store. All right. All right. Last couple articles here, uh, report Apple's building two iPhones for September release. There's a lot of uh, people saying, no, this is not happening. Some say it is. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. 
PayPal's hit 100 million active users, so that's a pretty big number for PayPal. The U.S. Supreme Court today struck down a California law saying video games are protected as free speech. So basically they uh, can't prevent games from being sold to minors that are um, rated as being violent. So that's uh, something new. And you, those of you that have been having trouble that are minors trying to trouble getting games in California, this will not be the case for much longer. Fring is a new iPad app that allows you to do a four-way group video chat. So I have that link up in the show notes for you to check out. Um, one thing I've been curious about here recently is the, you know, I follow a lot about what's going on with privacy. And it's interesting to read the erosion of, of our privacy and what's happening in other countries as well. But there's a good over on Dvorak Uncensored talking about 26 nations who have demanded personal user info from Google. And it breaks down the list of countries that have asked for information. And it doesn't shouldn't surprise you that U.S. is in that list. But the figure shows that Brazil still leads the way in requesting that Google remove content from a service. And South Korea, Germany, Libya, and India are others as well. Uh, private information about Google's users was demanded by governments of police for a total of 14,201 times in 26 developed countries in the last six months of the last year. According to uh, figures released for the, for the first time from the internet giant, I have the link up in the show notes here for you to check this out. But uh, Google began releasing his half yearly transparency report in April 2010 as a way to highlight state censorship and just basically give you numbers on how many actions are being taken. So, I guess this should not come as a surprise, but it's cool that Google releases this information. All right, iPhone and PS3 hacker GeoHot is now working at Facebook. So uh, he's moved from uh, hacking to uh, getting a job. <laughs> and um, so, of course, he's the guy that uh, was uh, responsible for breaking down PlayStation 3 security. and But now he's under the same roof that uh, Mark Zuckerberg built. So hacker in the house. Microsoft is reporting a new rootkit infection requires a Windows reinstall. And this is the first time this has ever been basically announced by Microsoft that they would someone would actually completely have to reinstall Microsoft to get rid of something. But a new variant of a Trojan Microsoft calls Pop Popper Pop U well, let me give it to you. P O P U R E B Popper Reb. It says, dig so deeply into the system that the only way to eradicate it is return Windows to its out-of-the-box configuration. They do have uh, some updates. If you've done regular updates to your machine, it should be protected uh, from this malware. But um, this has been going on for a while. And uh, so anyway, if this rootkit gets in, you're, the only way to uh, recover is basically to completely reinstall Windows. And that just sucks. Right, turn turntable.fm is uh you know got real popular real quick and is becoming a a great uh, source for music but apparently turntable fm uh, becoming under the heat of the RIAA through its mice, music licensing agencies who they represent and basically told them they had to shut this thing off from non US users so this past weekend turntable officially blocked all non US users um and after it basically was informed that its current licensing methodology only covered those of us here in the U.S. So if you're using uh, turntable.fm, they are no longer available for you. And they got to get this licensing stuff figured out. All right, let me go ahead and get right into the email here. If, again, if you've got comments on today's show, geeknews at gmail.com. Of course, the voicemail hotline is 619-342-7365. Got an email here from Jim. He said, hey, Todd, I saw this paid app on makeuseof.com the other day and never bought an app and thought this one would be my first. I'm not sure if Geek News is on it or not. It's called Pocket Cast. It's an awesome new podcast app for the Android iPhone. Sadly, I didn't find my show on there, and I found no way to get it added. So trying to make that happen, Jim. So thanks for a heads up. If you find it on there, let me know. i um, got an email here from... Uh, uh, from Lennox, basically saying, hey, Todd, uh, talking about the TSA agent making elderly women remove their adult diapers. So we covered that during the show. Thanks for that email, Lennox, as well. Got an email here from uh, from Brian talking about uh, the set-top boxes and draining power. 
This has been in the news for a couple of days. I want to thank uh, Brian for that as well. So that's all the links we got in uh, in email for the show, and uh, no voicemail comments tonight. So we're going to get you out of here on time. It's great to be back in Honolulu. Still dragging a little bit from uh, from jet lag. So hopefully a few days here I'll get completely uh, back on Honolulu Standard Time. So I want to thank all of you for coming out and hanging out for the show today. Again, the show hotline is 619-342-7365, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can tweet me at Geek News, and we look and bring in the first edition of the Chrome Show to you this coming Saturday. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors, ADT. Make sure you get it. You go over there and check out ADT, and if you're looking for the uh, to get a security system with them, dial 1-866-778-3127. Call them now. Operators standing by. And, of course, the link is up there in the show notes as well where you can request information. They'll be with us here for a couple more weeks as an advertiser, and we hope that you'll give them a try and see what they can offer for you. Of course, GoDaddy as well. Don't forget about our GoDaddy promo codes at geeknewcentral.com forward slash GoDaddy. We'll have some new deals for you in July. And if I didn't mention on the last show, I want to say congratulations to um, my GoDaddy rep. She's about ready to uh, – um, they're – have a she's her and her husband are having their first child and it should go without saying give a warm congratulations as well to angelo mandato our cio at raw voice for the birth of his son this morning nicholas uh mom and child and father are doing fine so i found that out this morning when talking actually saw the tweet and then called angelo up so 5 30 in the morning so they had a long night at the hospital and another raw voice employee uh Cameron was married this weekend, so his, him and his lovely bride are now on their honeymoon. So congratulations to him. So a lot of additions to the Raw Voice family. So it's been kind of an exciting weekend. We were kind of expecting this. Meanwhile, Mindy, our sales manager, she's down with a softball tournament. So we're kind of short-handed this week at Raw Voice. It's going to be fun uh, manning the phones. But, uh, yeah, good time of year to be there. Everyone's on summer break. Hey, starting next show, we're going to have a new contest, and I hope that you'll uh, – You'll jump in and participate and uh, make sure that you listen to uh, to the next show. Again, it's been my pleasure to bring it to you. Todd Cochran here from Geekness Central. We'll see you next time. Take care and aloha.